Good afternoon, everyone. We're just getting settled here. All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. We can take down this, this slide here. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our event, uh, Volunteerism, A Bold Conversation 2022. My name is Tracy Nielsen, and I serve as the Executive Director for Hands-On Twin Cities. I use the pronoun she, her, and I would also like to acknowledge that today I sit on the indigenous lands of the Wapikut and Ocheti Shakoin tribes at my home in Minneapolis. Hands-On is a 103-year-old volunteer center that works to inspire, equip, and mobilize people to provide hands-on impact to solve the most pressing challenges in our communities. Annually, we work with more than 600 nonprofit organizations, assisting them with their volunteer management and recruitment needs. We've supported more than 150 BIPOC-led small businesses with pro bono capacity building support to sustain and grow their operations this past year. We collaborate with companies, large and small, to empower employees to serve the community in a way that builds upon corporate social responsibility goals, directly activating about 20,000 corporate volunteers a year. And for individuals, we're the easiest way for you to make a difference by connecting you to volunteer experiences with local organizations that align with your time and expertise. We're thrilled to be hosting this event today in partnership with The Wolf Coach, Sina Hodges, and our special guests because we believe that volunteerism should be the start of a journey towards equity here in the Twin Cities. Today on MLK Day, we honor the life and work of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and encourage all Americans to volunteer to improve their communities. Together, we can strengthen our community, bridge divisions, address social problems, and move closer to Dr. King's vision of a beloved community. We hope that volunteers become active participants in the Twin Cities civic fabric, advocating for a more vibrant and equitable city for all. And we believe that starts with important conversations like the one that we're going to have today. We're very grateful to our sponsors, General Mills, Target, and 3M for making today's event possible. This year's event will be a little bit different in format. We will have about 40 minutes of pre-recorded content featuring one-on-one -on -one interviews with each of our esteemed leaders that will then be followed by a live Q&A session with all of them together. A special thanks to Chris McDuffie Photography for partnering with us to create this content. So we hope you enjoy and sit back and relax. Good afternoon, I'm Tracy Nielsen, Executive Director of Hands-On Twin Cities, and I'm thrilled to be with you this afternoon to have an open and honest conversation about volunteerism and racial equity. I'm joined this afternoon by four outstanding guests, including Sina Hodges, founder of The Woke Coach, Adair Mosley, President and CEO of Pillsbury United Communities, Danielle Grant, President and CEO of Achieve Minneapolis, and Renee Dossman, President of Neighborhood Development Center. Special thanks to our sponsors for making this conversation possible, including General Mills and Target. So let's get to it. Hi, Sina. Thank you so much for being with us today uh, to have this important conversation. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me here. Tracy. Yeah. Can we just start off? Tell us a little bit about who you are. Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Sina Hodges, and I'm the founder and CEO of a company called The Woke Coach. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we love the woke coach and you're a familiar face to hands on and probably many of the people who are participating in this and just very excited to be having this conversation to get things rolling. We'll just hop right into it. Right. Um, let's just talk a little bit about how um, the intersectionality between like your work and volunteerism. You know, we've been yeah. doing a lot together over the past few years and mm -hmm. how sort of um, the work around DEI, um, systemic inequity shows up within volunteerism. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's interesting because we're taught a lot of things as young people and volunteerism is one of those things that is like ingrained in most of us. It's something that we do all the time, whether it's when you're young and it's with your place of worship, whether it's, you know, every year when you're going to school, there's some sort of drive for either coats or food. There's, there's always been this notion of volunteerism ingrained into who we are and what we do. I think the thing that's been interesting about volunteerism historically has been we volunteer on our own terms. 
Mm-hmm. And oftentimes we don't volunteer with an eye toward what folks actually need. We think that folks need things that we would need if we were in their circumstance, but sometimes we don't have those community relationships. And if we don't have those community relationships, they can keep us from being the best volunteers that we can be. Absolutely. So kind of just showing up with the intent of like, here's what I want to do. Here's how I want to give back. And and to a certain extent, it is like leveraging your talents and thinking about what you have to give. Um, but also kind of having a little bit more cognition or sort of stepping it's, back in it's, a way? It's absolutely that. It's that awareness piece, right? And so we can't do anything without true awareness. We can we can participate, but if we don't have real awareness, sometimes it can be causing a ton of harm, right? right. And so the reality of it is because we want to be uh, philanthropic, because we want to show up, because we want to make a difference, all of that is wonderful. But in the same way that we would show up for, um, say, a job interview, we you prepare for that. And I think what folks haven't thought about historically is that if you're going to be a volunteer, if you're going to be a successful volunteer, you actually have to prepare for that. Right, right. So we've talked a lot. Um, Part of these tools and resources is giving people sort of the opportunity to step back and learn about different things going on in the community, um, dig deeper on some of the issues and, um, you know, try to contextualize the volunteer experience because while you might be showing up to serve a sandwich or do something in the moment, obviously the systemic issues are much bigger than that. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I tell clients all the time uh, about the notion of volunteerism or even the notion of being an accomplice, you know, in our work at The Woke Coach, we always talk about taking people from ally to accomplice. And the reality of being an accomplice is what that means is that sometimes you have to choose your lane, right? If you think about how inequity exists in the world, it's everywhere. It, it, there's not a place or space like it's It's in every nook and every cranny. And so the reality of it is that as folks start to develop their self-awareness and they start to learn more about the inequity that exists all around them, the thing that happens is that you immediately become overwhelmed. And I get that. I totally get it because it's everywhere you look. So of course you'd be overwhelmed. And what I tell folks all the time is that it really makes sense to think about what it is that you're most passionate about. And what we know is that whatever that thing is that you're most passionate about, there's some inequity there. Right. So if you're most passionate about education, look at Minnesota and look at our statistics. It'll tell you everything that you need to know. If you're passionate about um, home ownership, if you're passionate about healthcare, it doesn't matter what area you pick. There's some inequity there. And so as an individual, you get to, to choose your lane. And one of the things that's super cool about choosing a lane is that once you choose a lane, there's no way that healthcare doesn't intersect with education and mm-hmm. doesn't intersect with the criminal justice system or law enforcement. Like it all overlaps, right? It's like this big ball of yarn. And essentially it's like you just pulling your string, right? right. And so it's really important for us to think about what are the things that we are most passionate about, really leaning into those things and understanding, you know, quite honestly, if you choose something that you're super passionate about, it means that you will do it every single time. It means that someone won't have to send you 16 emails to get you to show up, right? (laughs) You won't have to be (laughs) voluntold. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's something that you'll engage in over and over and over again. And I think that's the piece that is sometimes missing for folks when they think about volunteerism. Yeah. So just thinking about, um, I don't know, myself and all of us as we have gone through um, the past few years and, you know, like a lot of passion and a lot of enthusiasm, but we're also maybe feeling a little depleted ourselves and sort of working through all of these things. But like this urgency is right in front of us. I guess I'm just going to, if you have the answer (laughs) uh, for how can we continue to maintain that passion and also recognize that we are going through an interesting time in history. Like never has it been, well, it's always been urgent, but it feels so urgent yeah. now. But yeah. at the same time, we're kind of maybe running on empty a little bit. Yeah. You know, the murder of George Floyd was um, horrific, right? And it was a turning point for people in their engagement. And people were really, you know, I think that we were home. There was a pandemic happening. You, were, you could not not engage with what was happening in the world. And I think the ripple effect of his murder, it just reverberated everywhere. And I think for the first time, people, some people were just like, oh my goodness, there's, there's real inequity. There are things that I need to do. And it was almost like the, the blinders came off. And so what we noticed is that people started, you know, jumping higher, running faster. And that was really great. But I do notice that there has been a sense of fatigue around the work. And there's been a sense of fatigue around 
our collective responsibility. And a lot of times it's, it's someone thinks that, well, you know, if I just back out for a little bit, somebody else will take it on, or I don't really have to do it, so it'll be okay at the end of the day. And I think it's, it's why I talk to folks all the time about choosing something that you're passionate about. Because if you're passionate about it, you're more likely to stay engaged over the long term. So that's, that's the first thing is really choosing these places and spaces where we want to make a difference because we will show up with greater consistency. I also just have to name that we're dealing with centuries of oppression and we're trying to unwind hundreds of years. So, you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, if you take from 2020 to 2022, I mean, that's like, what, 10 minutes? <laughs> Right. So we're not we're not in it feels yet. Like it sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like a hundred yes. years. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. what I want to say is that if you're a member of a dominant culture, you know, if you're white identified, if you're able bodied, neurotypical, you know, all of the things that we identify as as dominant markers, it is incumbent upon us to use our power and our privilege for the benefit of others. Because the little bit of tired that we feel right now, folks have been super duper tired for a very long time. Absolutely. Right? So, so we, you know, you can complain about that. And if you need to take your breaks, take your breaks, practice some self-care, but you can't opt out. Right. You can't opt out. We know too much now, right? When you see it, you can't unsee it. The inherent question is, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. Yeah. So as people sort of get that energy, they're, how do we sort of continue to dig deeper on that? learning about the issues are there things that you find to be you know a good way to kind of contextualize the community it's so much as you mentioned <laughs> it is I mean, so much say, it's like, so much but you know what i think i think it's really important for us to revisit how we got here yeah because i think sometimes people think uh like these issues that that plague us you know issues of relationships with law enforcement and communities or you know healthcare systems and inequities that exist there these have been since the origin of these institutions and so for us to recognize and contextualize how long these things have been happening, this didn't just start back in 2000, which honestly, when you say 2000, that doesn't feel like a long time ago. It wasn't, but it was like 22 years ago yeah, now, right? Yeah. So the reality of the situation is that we really have to familiarize ourselves with the how we got here. And people might say things all the time, like, you know, slavery was so long ago and I didn't own any slaves. But the reality of it is that the vestiges are still with us today, right? right? The inequity still persists today. You know, Minnesota is a state that has a lot to think about with regards to how we create more racial equity, Absolutely. right? So I think people should really be invested in finding out how we got here. Really, and not just understanding the moments in history, but also understanding the laws that supported, right? Right, right. Some of the ridiculousness that has, that has happened and continues to happen. You know, when you talk about it being illegal, you know, for certain things to happen or certain people, people who look like me, black people to own homes, like that was a law. We're not making that up, right? And when you talk about, you know, separate but equal and segregation, and there's, there's such a rich history of um, how we got here. Right. And so for us to ignore what we know to be true about our collective circumstance, that's foolhardy. We're grateful for our relationship with you, for all that you do for community and for continuing to push us as we think about volunteerism and the way that um, systemic inequity plays a role in, in all that we're doing. So thank you so much, Sina. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate you. Special thanks to Sina for her insights and thoughts, always very profound. Next, we'll be speaking to Danielle Grant, President and CEO of Achieve Minneapolis. Well, thank you so much for being with me today. Really excited to learn more about all that you're doing. Can you just give us a brief introduction of who you are and what you do? Sure. I'm Danielle Grant, and I'm the President and CEO of Achieve Minneapolis. Awesome. Can you t uh, share a little bit more about what Achieve Minneapolis does? Sure. Uh, Achieve Minneapolis is uh, primarily a college and career readiness organization. So um, Achieve is, number one, the strategic nonprofit partner of Minneapolis Public Schools. Uh, in that role, we serve as the foundation for Minneapolis Public Schools and raise money for strategic priorities. So that's kind of one side of the house. But what most people know about is the career and college readiness work that we do. So at uh, Achieve Minneapolis, uh, we run the Step Up Summer Employment Program with the City of Minneapolis and other partners, um, providing summer uh, employment experiences for um, students within Minneapolis. We also have the Achieve College Internship Program in which Achieve alumni are coming back um, following their junior year of college and getting those college internships, leading them into uh, future employment. And then we have our Career and College Centers, which is probably our largest program. 
and the Career and College Centers are physical locations within Minneapolis and now St. Paul Public Schools oh. um, in which students can come in and get career and college advising, assistance, filling out applications with their FAFSA, learn about internships, learn about different career paths, um, just pretty much all that they're going to need to start making those future plans. So, you know, we work um, with approximately 20,000 young people every year through all of our programs. Oh my gosh, that's amazing, 20,000. Um, and always <laughs> growing, I'm sure. It has grown um, significantly over the last few years as we've moved into St. Paul. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about, I mean, we're not in normal times. Mm -hmm. um, what has the transition looked like for you as um, education and everything has mm -hmm. changed and uh, there was online learning for yeah. a blip? Um, what mm -hmm. has been going on for yeah. the last two years? Well, you know, in Minneapolis and St. Paul Public Schools last year, they were in online learning the entire year with the exception of three weeks at the end of the year. So it basically was an entire school year. Uh, in which people were working and learning from home. Um, you know, basically to summarize what has changed is everything. We've had to completely reinvent everything that we do. So this school year, of course, we're back in buildings um, again, and there have been some internships that have moved back into in-person. Um, but I will say what has changed is there's much more hybrid, much more things that are remote, um, you know, for uh, Step Up, for example, um, when COVID hit, we basically lost every internship that we had planned that summer. And, you know, we're usually talking about 750 internships for students um, 16, and, 16 to 21, um, which are, is level two, which is the level that Achieve works with. Um, and we lost basically all of those internships and then had to try to create something for students to be able to do that summer and frankly to earn money as well because these are paid internships in a typical summer our interns earn approximately three million dollars that's real money that is helping support their families and so it was a big concern um, fortunately we were able to create some virtual internships as well as some paid online uh, professional development opportunities so students had the ability to go online and and do some different career modules, and then if they completed all the modules, they would get a stipend. So students were able to earn some money. Um, summer of 2021, we were, you know, once again, kind of increasing the number of hybrid, remote, or a few in-person internships, as well as continuing with that online training program. Uh, this year, we're really hoping to get our numbers back closer to about 450, um, because we really just have to rebuild. A lot of employers who have been with our step up program for a very long time and are really committed to employers are still working remotely. Right. And so it's a big thing to wrap your brain around, how am I going to uh, supervise and mentor a high school student in what's usually their first professional work experience, either hybrid or remote, right? right? So it's, we're lucky now that we have lots of examples of how this has worked successfully and people can then like start thinking about it and modeling it um, for their own um, situation in their own company. Um, so we're really trying to kind of rebuild that now. So that was completely challenging. Also, when school was completely remote, um, we had to take everything online. So, you know, we took all this one-on-one -on -one advising and, you know, helping students fill out college applications, like all of that we just had to do you know, it was like Microsoft Teams, Google Meets, <laughs> Zoom, like we'll, WebEx, we'll do all of it. Like basically anything that would work. Um, our career experiences where we used to be able to like bring volunteers into the school, you know, we'd have a, a STEM event, for example, at say like Henry High School. And so we'd bring people with careers in STEM to come and talk to young people with career interest in that area. Well, we weren't able to do that, obviously, but we were able to take it all online. So we would do a Zoom session in which students would be able to Zoom in and we'd have a virtual panel. Uh, we were able to record all those panels, so we do have that now as kind of a, a career experience library that students are able to use. Um, and we're trying to get more, back to more in-person events again, um, but it's still challenging because it is, there are limits to how many people are allowed in school buildings right now, obviously. So, you know, it's the career experiences, it's like it's a little bit of, like, 
not as robust as it was able to be kind of before COVID, but I do think that we're finding ways to have it be good experiences for young people and, you know, hopefully the adults enjoy it as well. Absolutely. Pivot, 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 right? That's right. That's right. We just, we've had to learn how to be really flexible yeah. and completely give up, well, this is the way we've always done it, yeah. right? So, you know, when, when COVID hit, um, we were right in the middle of like step up workforce development training. We do training for 2,000 young people every year with a training that's certified by the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. And we had had two of the sessions and then it was, the governor was shutting it down and we were supposed to have 500 kids showing up on that Saturday. Oh my gosh. And it was like, and we're taking it online. Um, and so it was very much just like, reinventing the car as we were driving it and trying to figure out how can we make some sort of good experiences for young people. I mean, no matter how all of us as adults have been impacted by the pandemic, it's nothing compared to what young people are going through. And, um, you know, young people are amazingly resilient, but I think everyone needs to be thinking about what would, how disruptive would that be to your development as an adolescent, um, what they've been through the last couple years. And so, you know, what we've been talking about in youth development and education, right now it's all hands on deck and everybody just needs to do everything that they can to make sure that this generation of young people can transition to adulthood successfully. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing more information with us, contextualizing this experience for volunteers mm -hmm. and for the amazing work that you do and all of the pivots and all of the transitions mm -hmm. that you and your team have made over the last several years, well, over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. right? We're always uh, growing and learning. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Huge thanks to Danielle for her perspective and for the amazing work that she's doing with young people in our community. Next up, we'll be speaking with Adair Mosley, president and CEO of Pillsbury United Communities. Adair, thank you so much for being with me today. Really excited to talk to you. Likewise. Just very grateful for you taking the time to do this. Thank you. Um, will you just start off telling us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, wonderful. Adair Mosley, and I serve as the president and CEO of Pillsbury United Communities, a 140-year-old um, community impact organization here in the cities. Awesome. So... I know you do all of the things. All of the things. All of the things. But we'll just try to keep this within a three to four hour time frame. No, yeah. just kidding. Uh, can you tell us more about what Pillsbury United Communities does? Yeah. So fortunate to lead such an inspiring and impactful organization. But we, um, at the core of it, are community builders co-creating enduring change toward a just society. And that's undergirded by a vision that every person has personal, social, and economic power. That work manifests itself into three um, areas for us people, place, prosperity, people achieving greater health and well-being, place, it intersects at place, certainly thinking about how the tools of both art and community voice can be leveraged for social justice and change, and prosperity, the ability to earn, learn, dream on one's own self-actualized and self-determined future. And so all of that work comes together under a myriad of programs and services that are operated out of neighborhood centers and social enterprises. And it, this always astounds me. How many like locations and sites do you have? Yeah, so <laughs> four neighborhood centers okay. um, that, are, again, are offering a mirror of those programs and services that I mentioned. And then there's six social enterprises. So North Market, we operate the community-based newspaper in North Minneapolis, a bike shop in South Minneapolis, a host of... <laughs> entrepreneurial activities happening across the organization. That's amazing. I couldn't yeah. believe it when you like gave me the layout of programs. I was like, you are literally all over the place doing all of the things. It's so impressive. Yeah, thank you. You know, it, it's work that comes together because we see the work of community-based organizations as holistic, whole, whole families, whole communities. And so we try not to silo the work, although it's deeply important to work in partnerships with uh, other organizations but we really see it as a holistic approach and strategy to reaching the aspirations of community. Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't know if any of us have been immune to what has been going on like the last two yeah, years. For sure. um, so how have things shifted for you following all of the events, the pandemic, everything? I mean, what has that looked like from a perspective of being in community in the way that we yeah. exist and you run programs and just yeah. we go through our day to day? Yeah. What has that been like? 
You know, certainly the disruptive forces of 2020 um, allowed us all to take a moment of reflection. Who do we want to be? What type of organizations do we want to work in and lead and steward in this moment? I'm fortunate that the organization was able to step up and meet the acute needs um, of the moment. And that's a lot around food insecurity, housing insecurity, as COVID, as you all know, um, disproportionately impacted certainly communities of color and the demographics in which we're serving as an organization. But here's what it also, I think, did for us um, was catalyze our strategy, give it momentum, crystallize our thoughts around what is it that we want to do? What's the outcome that we seek in a community with such pervasive and disturbing disparities? And how do we double down on the strategic things that are going to allow us to take leaps in community rather than incremental improvements? And so if anything, what I'm, what I'm really inspired by is our ability to think about the systems that really undergird such, again, um, disturbing disparities here in our region. And so we are on a march forward, rapidly thinking about how do we create this just system, just society. That's amazing. Well, you're giving me energy. I'm just like, let's go. <laughs> let's like, go. Let's do yeah. it. I mean, I love hearing that, like, that while a lot of the events have been just so Ugh, it's but there is hope and sort of this momentum to go forward um just super inspiring yeah. i love that how do we not let a you know a crisis go to waste right and certainly um not minimizing the the impact that both george floyd's murder and COVID 19 has had on individuals and families and especially those that are proximate to social justice work it's really heavy but at the same time it's an, a moment for us to say here's an opportunity and what do we do with this moment? And where do we go from here is the question that I call in every every room. Yeah. Where do we go from here? Yeah. So obviously you're doing this in collaboration with community. And I just wonder, so how do how does um, community continue to rally around you in this work, um, including volunteers to support the work that you've been doing? Or do you have stories of how that has emerged over yeah. the last two years? Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for your leadership, certainly in this space, in being the platform, being the container for volunteers to be able to get connected to the work that we're doing as an organization. And it's a moment that all of us need to lean in. And so I believe in the power of cross-sector partnership. I believe that both our corporate and, and community-oriented individuals can contribute to this work by bringing their skills, their talent, their time, their treasure to this work. And so that is what I really challenge everyone to do in this moment, that there is something out there. Every organization, including Pillsbury, needs the power. Um, we need that kind of cross, again, cross-sector, cross-collaboration. Um, and so that's what I'm hoping. And that's what has actually shown up um, over the last two years for us as an organization. More people raising their hands and saying, I want to be a part of this movement. And that is, that's inspiring to, for people to say, this is not a moment, this is movement work, yeah. right? And movements require solidarity, concentration, really uh, mobilization around an issue. And so that's where I think volunteers can center their energy. Absolutely. So as a, you know, having locations throughout the community, as people are thinking about, we're always talking about contextualizing the volunteer experience. So yeah. um, in the past, people may have thought of volunteerism as possibly being kind of just transactional, like mm -hmm. you show up, you deliver the jacket or that. Um, it, are there opportunities for people to sort of deepen their learning and experience um, that either you provide or, or just recommendations that you think to have that holistic volunteer experience for people to really engage and be yeah. in community? Yeah, what I believe in this moment is when volunteers come in, what we're trying to really create as part of that experience is that volunteers come in with a, a deep sense of humility and not hubris, yeah. but really saying how they can work alongside communities, how they can um, understand. Oftentimes it's individuals that come with an immense amount of privilege and how, how are they aware of that and showing up in a space that says community has the answers. They have the solutions, and how do we work alongside those to be able to usher in the type of transformative impact? Um, and that this is not about charity. And if you see yourself as going to provide a charitable action, um, in particularly what has been communities of color, that's the wrong orientation. This is about you seeing your liberation, um, the liberation of communities in which we serve 
deeply tied to your own and wanting to create the pathways for that to be able to happen. And with that, there's a lot of work, yes. right? <laughs> and so organizations like ours um, have a deep need for individuals to bring the, their best thinking. I always tell, um, you know, I tell my board this, right? Don't stop the good thinking that you do for company A here yeah. in the metro and don't bring that good thinking here to our organization yeah. because those are the that's that same critical thinking that I need to be able to push this organization forward. So that skills-based volunteerism is so important. There's more opportunities for young people to work alongside in mentorships, um, opportunities, internships. And so I think we are redefining the word of volunteerism. And Yay. so, uh, and, and thank you, but um, a great opportunity for people to be able to bring their full selves to this work. Absolutely, I think that's so important. So you mentioned different skills-based opportunities and things like that. Any other practical ways that you're looking for people to show up or places that they can find you know, they've listened to you, they've heard you, they're fired up. Um, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, go. yes. So, um, you know, kind of at the low level, right, with lots of opportunities and food shelves and, um, you know, community meals and people who just kind of want to provide that transaction and help um, in programs, a lot of opportunities for people yeah. to do that. Then kind of going up the next ladder is a lot of skills-based volunteerism. We have a tech center. We have um, folks that are need financial literacy coaching, our families, um, lots of those kind of tools. Mm -hmm. And then I would say at the systems level, organizational level, certainly I'm, I'm in the process of now of looking for board members, people that want to bring um, their time, their talent to the organization. And so we have a myriad of uh, specialties that we're looking for in that area. And then we have um, projects, right? We have social enterprises. And so those that are thinking about business innovation and the power of social enterprise and, and helping to grow, whether it's marketing strategies, customer segmentation, all of those really tools that help drive companies <laughs> yeah. are the same types of uh, core competencies that we're looking for in the organization. It sounds like you have limitless opportunities. Limitless. <laughs> yeah. Contact us. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so so what's your website? Yep. PillsburyUnited.org. Awesome. And we also host a lot of your opportunities at HandsOnTwinCities.org. Absolutely. People search our database. Yeah. Anything else as sort of we think about this culmination? Uh, the intersection, all of the change that's happened uh, that you want to highlight at this time. Well, thank you again for just the platform to be able to elevate the work. And hopefully this is inspiring individuals. You know, we, we are very fortunate to be, live in a very altruistic kind of community yes. and people who want to be able to help. And so we need that energy to get us to the next phase. Um, and as long as people, and I'll, I'll reemphasize this, as long as they see that they're coming into communities that have the solutions, that have the answers to some of the questions, but have been merely denied the opportunity. And so when people have that orientation, those are the folks that we welcome into our community to work alongside of us to build a more just and equitable place. Well, we are so fortunate to be partners in helping you achieve this work. And just, I think your passion just embodies this excitement about what is really possible. You know, over the last few years, a lot of us have just felt like energy sucked and things. And I think this conversation with you has given me a lot of energy to go on and I hope it inspires other volunteers to do so as well. Excellent. We're just Excellent. grateful for your leadership and all that you and your team do here in our community. Thank you. It's all possible. <laughs> it so, is. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Adair for the vast and expansive work that they're doing at Pillsbury United Communities. Next up, we'll be talking with Renee Dossman, president of Neighborhood Development Center. Thank you, Renee, so much for being with us today. Aww. It's always a pleasure to see you, you and to too. talk with you. Of course. Yeah, can you just start off by telling us a little bit about who you are, where oh, you work? Who am I? Where am I? <laughs> Deep questions. <laughs> right? Renee Dossman, the president of the Neighborhood Development Center. We support entrepreneurs, primarily low-income entrepreneurs, with training, um, technical assistance, if you will, helping them start their business, a business plan, which is crucial, um, marketing, branding, all of those things. And then we are also a community development financial institution. So we're a lender and we do our loans based more on your character and your commitment to community than your credit score. And then finally, we have um, um, incubators for our entrepreneurs. So real estate and where they can 
start their businesses and grow and all of those great things and our largest incubator is the midtown global market love the global, global midtown market. right like shout out to the market <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> right shopping eating <laughs> yes all, of all authentic all from all the different cultures so Absolutely. we um we feel really we co-own the midtown global market with uh cultural wellness center so that's amazing so yeah. renee um what has the last two years been like oh my uh, for, goodness. for you all for the entrepreneurs that you work with girl <laughs> in all honesty you know i started with the organization about two years ago a little bit over two years ago and you know i had all these plans for what we were going to do you know how we were going to you know work through our strategic plan we had a new one and then COVID hit and we had to to change like everybody else right we're instantly working from home we instantly put all of our train like all of our trainings were then online and zoom and we were working fast and furious to get money out to the entrepreneurs because access to capital at that time especially and to be honest with you a lot of them weren't able to get like the funding that was coming out because maybe they couldn't get their financial documents pulled together fast enough and the money was going like that so we we're like i mean like everybody on the team became lenders if you will and we're working with outreach to reach our entrepreneurs so we've just we were just running fast and furious and um one of the things that i noticed i had an encounter with an entrepreneur at the market and I was talking and she, I was like, you're not here. And it just dawned on me that this person needed some mental resources, right? Some mental health yeah. resources. Yeah. And so we actually started um, a program called Mindset Reset um, to help our entrepreneurs. So we started Mindset Reset. We did Tech Pack. Um, and we use that Mindset Reset um, work to also do it for our team. Because if you think about it, we're rolling, rolling, and then there's the murder of George Floyd. Yeah. And so my team, I just remember, like, I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, I didn't, first of all, I didn't know what to do with COVID. And I surely don't know what to do after this because I'm dealing with my own stuff. Oh, yeah. Right? We're um, all in it as humans. Yeah. Too. So yeah. it's just, long answer to a short question, It's it's been... It's been extremely difficult, but I'm going to tell you something. I feel so hopeful. I do. Because <laughs> I just love how people have shown up. Yeah. Like you're doing this and it's hard. Like yeah. somebody said to me, hard things are hard. And yeah. they are. Yeah. But you're doing this work and then people like your organization. Aww. Shows up along beside <laughs> us. No yeah. one brings yeah. in reinforcement. Yeah. Not only did you show up, but you brought some people yeah. along. <laughs> Right? Yes. So yes. then we're all in this together. And I, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm well, grateful. And Midtown Global Market, you mentioned the civil unrest. Yes. Um, you were basically sort of on the front line of we were. that experience. They tried to burn it down. And it's still standing. It is still standing. <laughs> we had um, entrepreneurs and um, people, there's uh, condos uh, above the market. And they came out and they formed a human chain around the market and kept it safe That's amazing. every night wow. and they patrolled so i remember when everything happened and i went the next day and i'm thinking i don't even know if the market's going to be standing here because i kept getting the reports and i got there and it was not only was the market standing there were all these people helping cleaning up yeah and it's just like this is what we're about and I understand it. I understand the rage. I understand it. I feel it daily. Yeah. But I was like, these entrepreneurs, like, they're just, they've been, they've just suffered so much with everything. And so, you know, you had your moment. I had my moment. The teams had their moment. And then we just get right back to work. Absolutely. Because we can't, we can't take our foot off the gas. This is too important. Yeah. Yeah. Too important. And I think um, for everybody, uh, we understood that there were many things bubbling under the surface that, mm -hmm. um, you know, George Floyd uncovered uh, not only for us, but yeah. for the world. And, you know, some of the systemic inequities that we as a community face. How do you see those inequities and those things play out in your work at NDC? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> you see it all the time, right? Like, that's why we exist, is to bridge that gap, right? Um, these, these entrepreneurs, they're not asking for a handout. They're just asking for the opportunity. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so getting them access to capital, getting them the training that they need, removing the barriers and the roadblocks so that they can start. When you start a business, first of all, that's bold, yeah. right? That's <laughs> courageous. Yeah. And I was at a graduation last night, one of our graduations for one of our training classes. And um, there was a speaker and, and he was from our program and he said, there was nobody in my family that had ever owned a business or thought about owning a business. I didn't have a roadmap, right? Yeah. I yeah. didn't have a blueprint on how to do this. And so that's what we provide at NDC. We provide all of those resources, complete wraparound services to help you start your business, have your business grow and thrive, but then it builds generational wealth. That's right. the trick, right? right. Like right. how do we, how do we help build generational wealth? How do we um, educate people that have don't have anybody in their family that's like, you want to start a business? Here's you know a million dollars. Here's fifty thousand dollars. Right? Like, right. Right. So it shows up in how fast. I'll give you an example. How fast that PPP money went the first round. How fast it went, and it went fast because there were people that were w literally waiting with their accountants could get into the system, get the money fat, like, yeah. and, it, and it wiped it all out practically. Yeah. Um, and then they figured out for the second round to give a window of opportunity for community development financial institutions like us so that we could get in there and get our entrepreneurs processed so that they could get access. Right. But if you didn't have all your paperwork lined up, if you didn't have technology, if you're just trying to do it on your phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, oh, girl, I We could. all learned. I <laughs> so we applied for those BPP. Yeah, right? you guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, it, 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 it is. You need um, certain things in place to really, you know, walk you through those steps. Yes. And it's not always intuitive. So. And if you don't have a relationship with the bank. Yeah. Because you're unbankable. Yeah. So yeah. it's there, but but what? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I loved what you said about everybody sort of showing up. And mm -hmm. I guess one thing that I'm just curious about is, sort of the role that people can play in supporting you. I mean, you have this amazing mission and you're doing this incredible work. And, and I'm like looking on the outside, how do I you know, really support the work that you're doing? Um, how can people continue to stand behind you, the entrepreneurs and um, support you? Well, first of all, thank you. Cause you do support us and um, your organization, Hands On Twin Cities has shown up in such a beautiful way. And we're really grateful for that. Because you didn't show up and say, this is what you need. And you showed up and said, <laughs> yeah. how can we be of service, yeah, right, yeah. to you? So I think, you know, the main thing is shop. Shop and support these black entrepreneurs, these Latino, Latina entrepreneurs, indigenous, um, Asian, Hmong, all of them. Like support these BIPOC entrepreneurs, right? So that's, that's one thing. Go to the Midtown Global Market, spend your money. Eat delicious um, food. Eat delicious food. <laughs> but I always say, you know, um, my team, they're so amazing, right? They, they just they give truly. daily. No, yes. seriously, they're, a, this, a, this, <laughs> it, it is amazing. But the, the thing that I, I think people forget is you can just use your natural gifts and talents. We don't need you to make something up. I don't need you to come to the market and try to be something that you're not or yeah. help us. We have an incubator that's um, on the east side of St. Paul that's for the construction and trade businesses. If you have a talent that, that that's your talent, you're a general contractor, you're a great carpenter, do, you come with what you, you, the gifts and talents that you have and we can figure it out, right? And we'll make space. Because there's the cool thing about entrepreneurship is that there's all kinds of businesses. Right. And there's all kinds of things that are needed, right? Yeah. And yeah. our organization, because we do those different disciplines, people that are teachers could help us. People, I mean, like any discipline you have, you yeah. could help. Yeah. So that's well, Renee. I'm just so grateful for all that you do, all that thank your team you. does. It's just a pleasure to work with you, thank and you. thank you for being with us for this conversation and sharing how people can get involved. Thank you so, so much. We'll continue our work together. Thank you. All I right. really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Huge thanks to all of our panelists for their insights. We'll have more detailed interviews available at handsontwincities.org for follow-up. 
and we're thrilled right now to be able to move into a live Q&A session moderated by Sina Hodges, founder of The Woke Coach. So stay with us. Hello, folks. Uh, my name is Sina Hodges. Like Tracy said, I am the founder and CEO of a company called The Woke Coach. I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge that I am in, I'm currently in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I am on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Anishinaabe and Wapakuti people past and present. Um, I do want to ask you all to just take a moment to find out whose land you live, work, and otherwise engage on. Uh, gain a better understanding of their issues and commit to being a better steward of the land that you inhabit, wherever that land may be. Before I invite the panelists to join me and we dive into this Q&A portion of our time together, I do wanna invite the audience to engage with the panelists through um, a couple of prompts. I'd like for you to just take a moment to um, ask yourself the following and, and engage with this and use the Q&A function on our um, lovely Zoom app here. But I wanna know from you, like what resonated with you about the video? So what resonated with you about the video? Uh, are there things that were made more clear? Are things clearer now? You know, are there additional questions that you have based on what you saw? So what I'd like for you to do is use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to give us your responses. Um, I will raise some of those questions to the members of the panel. And I do say some because I know that we can't promise to get to all of them in the limited time that we have together. But I really want you to think about what resonated with you about the video, um, what was clearer, and what additional questions did it create? I'd like to take a moment to reintroduce you to all of our esteemed panelists. They are Renee Dossman, who's the president of Neighborhood Development Center. Danielle Grant, who's president and CEO of Achieve Minneapolis. And Adair Mosley, who's president and CEO of Pillsbury United Communities. Hi friends. You can all feel free to unsilence yourselves. Let's... Hello. <laughs> I've been holding my breath. <laughs> been waiting with bated breath to get in there. Hi, friends. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm so good. I can't complain at all. Amen. So, you know, there are a lot of themes that came up in the video that we just watched. You know, one of the things that was important is thinking about the need that exists, uh, the inequity that persists. The fact that we're in a moment in time where we're working harder, uh, we're looking for folks to actually use their gifts and talents and opt in every single day. So I want to start by posing the same question to you that I just posed to the audience. And that question is what most resonated with you uh, about what you and your co-panelists had to share in the video? Yeah, I, I can start. First of all, thank you for having me here today. And what resonated with me is what a fierce panel, what a fierce group of people. Like, you, you know, you just, you get so caught up in your own world that you don't even, like, you don't know, I don't always realize, but you guys were doing your thing and doing it with such excellence that I am just really proud to be here. And so I, I love what Adair said about like, like how we could do redefining volunteerism. I feel like there's some things that have opened up to us now. And I think you mentioned it as well, Sina, is because we can't unsee what we saw. And I just feel like there's a lot of people and I run across them like when everything was happening, they didn't know how to engage and, and they felt like they had to do something special or different. And from everybody, even um, from what Danielle was talking about, about how they had to, to completely redo everything is that every your whatever you have is needed, and I and I just think that if we really truly want to redefine volunteerism, it's not about charity; it's about coming together, creating the equity, and doing this work. And then I think it's also about recognizing that it's going to be hard because, to your point, Zena, this is hundreds of years of oppression that we're dealing with. So I was super inspired, I, I, and I still am. As you can see, I'm fired up. So I'm going to shut up talking, but. Yeah, totally fired up. What, what stood out to me, I think, and, and you know, listening and uh, watching the video is just the 
the breadth and diversity of the opportunities that are out there. Uh, you heard from you know about three completely different organizations uh, doing different <clears throat> with different um, targeted populations, and so you know there's I mean and that just tells the story of our nonprofit community. I mean. Like, you know, people do joke that Minnesota is the land of 10,000 nonprofits, but, you know, there's a lot of organizations that are doing amazing work out there. So I think no matter what it is that you want to bring to the table as a volunteer, there's something for you. There's something that's going to resonate with you. There's going to be an organization that's a good fit for you that would be able to make use of your skills. So, I mean, that's always fun for me because like being in education, like I have a tendency to talk to a lot of other education folks. So it was, this was a fun conversation for me, um, talking to folks who are coming at um, the issues within our community, like in a different direction and taking like different strategies for that. Um, because all of our work is needed because jointly we're working towards the same thing. And that's a more just and equitable community. I think the question was posed to all of us on this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, you know, I am such a lucky cis uh, male um, today to be able to be joined with these three phenomenal women who are leading tremendous and impactful work here in our region. Um, I What resonated with me, I think much of what was already said, right, is that the uh, what always amazes me about uh, many, uh, Minneapolis St. Paul in our region is that we have all the ingredients to get this right. And uh, that the conditions exist of the private sector, uh, the, the NGOs and community-based organizations that are trying to lead a lot of individuals who are giving, again, their time and their talent to the work. And so there's something remarkable about, about that and just with the right alignment and um, uh, passion that I believe that we can start to eradicate um, together the disparities that exist within our region truly to get to this place of equity. And so that's the thing that I, I sit back in awe of, of just looking at um, and listening to all the wonderful, as Danielle said, the assets in our region. Thank you. You know, I, I want to acknowledge what's coming in in, um, in the form of like people talking about what resonated most with them. And a lot of the comments are around that notion of picking a thing that you're passionate about and, and really um, burrowing away at that, but also the notion of preparing to volunteer. I think there are folks that didn't think about the fact that as you get ready to go into a place and space, there is some preparation that needs to be done. I think also folks are really excited about the fact that um, to be a volunteer, you don't necessarily have to learn a whole new skill set. You can take what you already know, which you very eloquently talked about in the video, Adair, taking what you already know and taking your own skills and using those for the betterment of others. And um, you know, the reason why we're here today and, and having this event is not really simply just the celebration of Dr. King and his legacy. It is about the work that we do every single day to ensure both justice and racial equity and making sure that that persists in our communities. You know, in our businesses and organizations, we all do this work every single day. And one of the things that resonated with me was Renee talking about how uh, her organization provides loans based on character. And what a wonderful intersection, because as we know, Dr. King famously talked about people being judged, not by the color of their skin, but by oh the content God. of their character. Right. You know, And so when we think about big concepts like this and about how Dr. King is in our lives every single day, I do wanna, you know, juxtapose that with people talking about being prepared to volunteer and bringing their own skills. How do people who really want to volunteer begin to do this work every single day? How do folks opt in to do this every single day? You want to go out there? You got oh, I, 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 I desperately want to hear your, your response. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Oh my God, I'm still, let's be clear, I'm still shook from the MLK content to character. Oh, good job, Sina. So, you know, I think, how do they start? Yeah. Is that, was that the question? Yeah, how do you, how do you think, begin? How do you get in here? I think you just, you reach out. There's, you know, you can probably on all of our websites, there's a link to volunteer. And I think it's what you said about that preparation, but you come... If, if you can show up and be open 
to listen and to learn versus showing up to say, I'm gonna do this, right? Like what's needed in the space and how can I, how can I assist? Um, but it's not complicated and, and we don't make it complicated. Like you don't have to give blood or anything. Like you can just show up and we can put you to work, right? Nothing, you know, like it's, it's, you don't have, there's nothing, there's nothing complex about it. But I think it's scary to say, because you don't, you, because I think what it is, is that people think they're going to do harm. Like if I show up and I can't do this, or you guys are doing such great work and what could I offer and all of that's the stories that you tell yourself, like, we just need you. We need exactly like what Adair was saying. We need like what you talked about, like bringing your A game, you bring it there, just bring that here and you can do the same thing. So I think it's just like making that call, making that initial step and understanding that we're not just gonna throw you out there and say, hey, do this. We're gonna be there and to support you every step of the way. You're not doing it alone. You're doing it in community. And that's what this is all about like to say you know I think that's absolutely true like that to do it you just like reach out and, and there are opportunities for you but I also think you know like what strikes me about your question Sina is about how do you do this work every day and so like to me the the beauty of a volunteer opportunity is not that that you're just going there to to make change positive change the beauty is that it's going to change you and so, like, I think, you know, I think of times where we've had volunteers uh, come in and meet with students um, through our programs. And, you know, after the session is over, they say, oh, my gosh, that was amazing. Like, I, I hear so much about young people and teenagers and, you know, like, but these kids were great. And, <laughs> you know, I, I read about how terrible young people are and what a crisis it is. But, but these kids were great. Well, you know what? those kids just changed you because now when you read something in the paper about young people, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, I was at that high school and I met these young people and I saw that they want to talk about their future and they want to contribute to their community and they have big dreams. And now I understand them differently. So I'm going to be different in the world based on what I've learned. Right. So I think that's like a really important piece that this is an opportunity, um, not just to give back and come and be of service, but to actually grow and change yourself and, and be in the community in a different way. So what I'll also add, and I, and I think I'll take a, a slightly different perspective just to, to challenge the conversation a little bit here and provoke us. But what I think is also important in this time is that um, as mentioned, King's words called us um, it, when he talked about service, right? It compelled us to move beyond this place of charity. And it was truly, truly think about the evolution of the heart and mind, the eradication of oppressive systems and policies, and, and to also be unapologetic about justice for all. Mm -hmm. And what I hope that in this moment that people don't see that I go in and I provide a transaction or I provide my, and I dis disconnect myself again, I wanna point out that true liberation and so one of the ways that you can also be helpful for the organizations around this is that we're championing things about access to capital. We're championing things about a quality education. We're championing to eradicate why, what is bringing the person to the food shelf. And if we don't change the context in which people live their lives. And so that is also service, is when you join us in raising the fight, going to the halls of power, and working alongside of us. And I think that that is the place we all want to get to in, in this with true kinship. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I wanna be able to say, taking this beyond just this moment of, again, providing that transactional service while albeit certainly important for our organizations to sustain itself, that true solidarity will be joining us in the fight. Mm. You know, Adair, let's, yeah, let's, let's take that path because okay. one of the things that folks, don't always recognize is that injustice and inequity, it hurts everybody, not just the folks who are marginalized, right? Mm -hmm. And the folks who are historically underrepresented or, or you know, mm -hmm. so injustice and inequity, they really hurt everybody. You know, um, an artist named Lila Watson, she always, she famously said, um, 
if you have come here to help me, yeah. you're wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Mm -hmm. And so what folks do need to recognize is that volunteerism is really a path to liberation. And yes. I think that people don't really recognize and understand that by helping other folks and using your own power and your own privilege for the benefit of others, that is we really how, you know, when folks want to talk about a, a rising ship lifts all tides or a rising tide lifts all ships, right? Yeah. 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 So do we think that people, how are do we think that people just don't understand? Do we think that people don't understand that? How do we, how do we help people have a better understanding of that? That we're, it's, it's all tied together. I think when people just think of volunteerism as merely transactional. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily thinking about that bigger picture. They're thinking, okay, well, it seems like something like a nice thing to do. Um, but they, they, they don't always take a step back and look at that big picture about how their few hours of volunteer work is contributing, but they're like learning from that and then what they should be taking those learnings and, and implementing in other parts of their life. And, and I was thinking when you said that, what you said, Sina, about that book from Heather McGee, The Solidarity Dividend, like I think that's, you know, the sum of us when it talks about the solidarity dividend, but I think it, like how racism help, hurts everyone, even like it just, it, 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 it destroys everyone, not only the people that you're being oppressive to, but I also think there's probably some opportunities for us as nonprofits to do a better job of telling the story and connecting the entrepreneur back to the mission. And because it has been so transactional in the past and now we're trying to move people in a different direction because we know that there's other things that are needed. And so how do we do a better job of, of helping them understand like things like this helps, right? Like it helps raise your awareness that there's other ways that you can volunteer and how important that is. And I think any time you've ever done something for someone else, nine you usually feel better about yourself as a result. You go into something thinking, well, I'm going to do this for them. And then you come out of it like, wow, like we've just said, that just changed me, right? Like you change. But I think as a non, like I, I think in our organization, you know, we didn't always look at like, think about volunteers like that. Like we didn't think, well, what could a volunteer do for our organization? Because it's so, we're so yeah. different, blah, 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 but we're not. Yeah. I, I um, Sina, if I may, um, Susan's uh, comment here, and I, and I think it's, it's important to delineate those things. Um, and I, by no means do I want to say that charity is not needed, right? We have to be able to, a community has to be able to address the acute needs around both food insecurity, house, housing insecurity crises. And so all of our organizations in some facet are responding to that and being agile to that. But I've always been a believer that good charity work should inform something larger and um, that it should be leveling up to something. And so um, this is merely to compel people to think about, while yes, um, you provide a great and immense amount of capacity to the organizations when you come in and provide that service that ultimately our fight is to level that up to something and and being connected to that is highly important in using your voice you and wielding both your um, social and economic influence to be able to change those conditions are highly important for us as well mm -hmm. thank you adair i think you know what's also important is to you know the recognition that the work that we're doing, none of this lives in a vacuum. Yeah. And to be honest, the way forward for a lot of the issues that we are contending with right now is actually legislation, right? <laughs> legislation changes things, mm -hmm. right? You know, and sometimes I'll be honest, you know, there can be laws and, and things can happen and things can get slippery, but the laws are the first place and space that you get to point to when injustice is happening. You know, the King family recently said, you know, no celebration of King Day without legislation. And so what they're wanting is for folks to really get behind this voting rights legislation that really needs to be passed. And I want folks to really have a healthy understanding that while there are, like you talked about, Adair, there are lots of issues that we need to deal with, but there are also larger issues that we all need to be 
paying attention to, giving our um, dollars and our time to as well. And so when we think about issues like um, voting rights legislation, what are some of those issues, these other issues that you think folks need to really be paying attention to on a, on a grander scale? Well, you know, I would certainly say that uh, the justice, the George Floyd um, Justice and Policing Act, um, as you've mentioned, the John Lewis um, Act, and these are these are federal legislations, um, HR 40 that talks about reparations and that it's it's not just um, that this is truly economic justice and um, um, for, for for blacks, but locally here, as we talk about the Equal Rights Act that was put forward, as we talk about more access, to, um, what we do with the seven billion dollar surplus to be able to address true equity in our state. Um, how do we think about um, sitting in, in Danielle's work, and I, I don't want to co-opt this, Danielle, but certainly um, thinking about the alarming racial and um, education disparities that exist. And so these are all things. These are not. These are not both uh, systems and policies of the 60s. These are things that are confronting us today in 2022. And so um, I, I think, again, both companies and volunteers um, wanting to use and will their influence there is extremely important. Absolutely. Yeah, I have you know, had the opportunity to speak to the legislature and, you know, as we're thinking about, to your point there, the surplus that we have in the state, how do we use that? How do we, you know, like, and how do we, you know, we a lot of things happened after the murder of George Floyd, a lot of money was pushed around and how do we make sure that we get that into the communities that really deserve it and that need to, that need that money and those resources. And I think the legislative piece is a piece that a lot of us miss um, and that is, is a big opportunity for us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a big, that's a big piece. And I didn't know anything about it. I had no idea how to be in front of the legislature and, you know, but it's, you know, it's reaching across the aisle for, for us when I mean, we have to reach across the aisle to, to, to tell the story of our entrepreneurs, because they're not, sometimes they're not able to be in that room, um, and to be there where those decisions are being made. So how do we, if you're sitting at that table, how do you make sure that you're informed? Because we're not all sitting at the table at the same time. Some of us are never even invited to the table. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting there, how do you make sure that you're aware of these things like that Adair mentioned and that's yeah. and that you are sitting there as an advocate in solidarity with those other organizations that are dealing with that? Mm -hmm. yeah, I want to bring up something that's, that is uh, in the yeah. chat. Yeah. <laughs> and one of, the, yeah, one of the questions that are that's here in the chat is like um, wondering about how people move from that place of being a volunteer to a true change maker, you know, um, and how folks struggle with that. So what would we say about how folks do move from that place and space of being a volunteer to being a true change maker? I, uh... I would I would add that it is very um, it's personal, right? Um, and your journey is your journey, um, but the onus is on you. And there's just simply too many too many books and too much literature at this point for people to truly be able to understand. But also that I think we all create the conditions in our organizations to uh, for people to be vulnerable and to ask the questions, and that is without fear. Um, and so um, I, I think if it's coming from a well-intended place, you should always ask, ask the question for better and deeper understanding. And it is the, the true thing is the evolution of the mind that gets us there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You know, the other thing I just want to say, um, it's my own personal opinion, is I think that when we start thinking about the work of doing volunteerism, when we start thinking about how we change communities, how we, you know, offer the better parts of ourselves to others, Let's, let's not worry about titles. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Can we just get in the work and do the work with a level of consistency, <laughs> be dependable, show up for folks, let them know that you are their accomplice and that anytime that they need a thing, you're going to be there, they can depend on you. That yeah. is the greater mark. Um, I wanna disavow people thinking that you have to have a title to be a thing. Uh, you have to be present. Mm -hmm. So, so 
Let's think that. about how, how we show up and, and staying on the journey and opting in every day. Because no one can take that from you. No one can take your participation from you, right? If you're showing up every day, mm-hmm. trying to learn. And, you know, there you talk a lot about that spirit of showing up with a, a sense of um, humility, right? Not hubris. And that's a, that's a very important part of it. Showing up with um, knowing what you bring to the situation and circumstance, using your own gifts and talents and strengths like Adair talked about earlier, being prepared to volunteer, understanding what those needs are as articulated by the community and that organization, and um, intersecting that with what you're passionate about. You know, Danielle talked about the fact that we're the land of 10,000 nonprofits. So there's somewhere out there for you to connect to and to show up every day, every day, right? And I knew, you know, we all knew this, this time goes by so, so fast. And so the question I would like to, to ask both of you, all the three of you to contend with as we kind of transition out of this conversation is, uh, where do you think we go from here? I think we just, like I said, I, we don't take our foot off the gas. I think we just start if you're on the fence just do it. Like I think, and we've already, there's not much more can be said about using your gifts and talents, you know, something that you're passionate about connecting to that in some way. Mm-hmm. But what, if not you, who, mm-hmm. and what's holding you back? And only you can answer that question. And even if you only have an hour, that's an hour that we could use in our organization for sure, right? Like it doesn't have to be this, you got to show up every day, five hours a day, like, no. And now with the power of using Zoom, there's ways for you to be in the room, even if you're not physically in the room, just do it. Danielle, you want me to go? Oh, I'm gonna let you get the last word and I'll- (laughs) (laughs) Always good to end with the day. (laughs) But, you know, the one thing I'd like to add is just, you know, I, I, I think COVID and the murder of George Floyd and the ensuing events in our community really did provoke a groundswell of attention at, up towards inequities that have existed for a very, very long time. And I think there has been tremendous amount of interest um, from volunteers as well as the corporate community Um, on how to address the inequities in our community and do something about this. And if I could say anything today, it's that we still need you. Um, Yes, it's, you know, here we are, it's a year later, year and a half later, um, but the need is still there. And so like my biggest, it was so exciting to have the focus finally be on these issues that we talk about every single day, but we can't let that focus go somewhere else, right? And I, I think that just that sustained energy is the only thing that's gonna make systemic change because, you know, like, as we were saying, like there's actual legislation out there that needs support right now to make, to make changes. And, you know, like that's a little different than coming with the broom and sweeping up, but we need you just as much. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's what I would say, like, this is, this is like a marathon, not a sprint. And we need everyone's focus to stay on the needs of our community um, because that's the only way we're gonna make change. Yeah. Uh, just uh, beautiful and eloquent words by, by Brene and Danielle and you as well, Sina, about this work. Um, I, I think the only thing I would just add is that, um, you know, we've probably emphasized a lot today more than just right, again, some of those transactional things because the work that's left on the table has been, you know, is the work that we're describing that came out of a post COVID in um, um, George Floyd's murder. And so that's while our attention is focused there. And I would also say that much about what we're describing today is less, we know you have the talents, we know you have the skills um, to be able to come into organizations. And this is really about orientation and, um, and mindset and value alignment. And um, so I would, I would lastly offer that one things that people can do in preparation of coming into communities is to see our communities as assets and not to come in from a deficit-based thinking mm-hmm. um, and that you're not building on broken and doing your research. 
of who are the people that uh, are inspiring? What are the things that um, make a community to come together rather than the sensationalized headlines that you oftentimes read about our communities? And so when you do that and you come in and you want to learn and you want to enjoy and, and experience, you'll keep coming back. So that's what I offer. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'll wrap this up by saying it is absolutely incumbent upon all of us to use our power and our privilege for the benefit of others. And I want to be absolutely clear that we all have power and we all have privilege. Um, and so if you've not decided to actively use your power and privilege for the benefit of others, uh, I can't imagine what you're waiting for. You know, Dr. King famously said, the time is always right to do right. It's time. Thank you so much, panelists, for your time and attention today. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tracy, for having us. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Sina, for moderating our event. And to our panelists, Adair, Renee, and Danielle, for your insights, your honesty, and your openness in this conversation. And I just want to say that today's conversation does not end here. Hands on Twin Cities is committed to continuing conversation and providing ongoing resources for volunteers as you engage in community. Today's session will be available in the coming day to share along with resources and the longer interviews with each of our panelists. Um, and we have concrete ways for you to take action at handsontwincities.org. So please check out more information about all of our partners featured here today, including the Woke Coach. The staff at Hands On Twin Cities has been working with Sina and her team for the past three years, going through the From Ally to Accomplice program. It's been transformative experience for our team, deepening our analysis and developing an understanding of issues around racism, bias, allyship, and injustice. And they offer the From Ally to Accomplice program to businesses and organizations and folks anywhere in the world through an online community. Uh, once again, I just want to thank our sponsors, Target, General Mills, and 3M for uh, making today's event possible. And thank you all for your participation and taking this first step and continuing to learn and dive deeper. And in the words of Dr. King, everyone can be great because anybody can serve. So thank you all so much for your time today. And um, let's get to it, right? <laughs> if you're not fired up now, I don't know what it's going to take. So thank you so much to everyone and um, keep doing this work. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.